my brother and I were about 11 months apart in age. And when we were little kids, one of our favorite games to play was a game called Stuffed Animals. So we'd gather all of our stuffed animals in one of our rooms. And Troy used Mousy as his main character. And I would use my bear Ted Edward. We made up stories. And the typical narrative went something like, you know, Ted Edward and Mousy live in some sort of fortress. It's a castle. They really want out. And so they plot and they scheme and they plan. And one day they make their escape. So whether it was like digging under the castle wall to come up on the other side, or sometimes they take sheets and build them and shimmy out of a tower window to get out. Once they were out there, they never really had a plan. <laughs> so they would wander, and they wandered through the desert place, over the mountains, to the forest, where they found a circus. And that's where all the rest of our stuff came. <laughs> so we got all of them, and at the circus, they they find you know the mouse, the lion, the you know bear. Since Ted Edward was there. Um, see, you know, a snake, a seahorse, and all these animals cared about each other. They loved each other. They were interested in each other's success. They were a family. And Ted, Edward, and Mousy stayed there, and they lived happily ever after. <laughs> that when David asked me tonight to speak, you know, I was reflecting back on Lost and Found, and I realized, you know, with this story, that that's what I wanted as a child. I wanted a place where someone was interested in me, where someone loved me, where someone supported me. And that wasn't really my house growing up. So, you know, eventually I made it out of the castle, out of Georgia wandering in the desert place. My brother did the same. Troy's path took him into the dark land of schizophrenia, of voices in his head, of not being able to control what he thinks he does when he's with other people. It's a sad and lonely place. My journey got me out of the desert place into the mountains where I met my husband, got married, had kids, you know, but sometimes I didn't want to give up hope on the castle because I don't want to give up hope. I want to think, hey, there's possibility. So I, you know, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm going to try to do this relationship thing with my parents. And they were people who called if someone died. And that was the phone call. Hey, it's your mom. I'm like, oh, someone died. <laughs> So, I mean, that's it. Um, they didn't ever have us over for holidays. If there was a holiday, they were coming to our house. If it was a special occasion, our house. But again, not gonna give up hope. So, driving, they're about a mile and a half from us. I decide, I'm gonna pop in. I'm just gonna go visit, it's crazy. So I go, <laughs> get the driveway, knock on the door, my mom answers. Hey, what are you doing here? I'm like, I just thought I'd pop in. Pop, you know, we could just visit. She stands there, that door open. And at this moment, I realized that she would do the black shirts proud. <laughs> I am not getting across the line. <laughs> it is not going to happen. So we have this conversation where I'm on the porch and she's in the door. And eventually her eyes start to glance toward my car. <laughs> my cue to go. Yeah. So, you know, that continues for a while. By um, our late 30s, Troy had had enough of schizophrenia. What he wrote in his note was, I feel there are demons that are trying to get out of me, and the only way to destroy them is to kill their host. I am so tired, Troy. A few months after my brother died, 
my mom ended up in the hospital, so she has pancreatitis and a bad attitude. So, <laughs> between, you know, it's like she's sick and she won't work with her therapist, and they're really trying, she, you know, in a matter of months, she's in a nursing home and in a wheelchair, and that's where she's going to be. So now I'm visiting her in the nursing home, and I go, and, you know, I make it in the door because she can't block me, and I go into her room, and usually her roommate was, you know, out socializing with people, which my mom would not be doing on a Saturday morning ever. <laughs> so I go in and I sit on the bed or sometimes in the folding chair and she's in her wheelchair and the TV is on which she does not turn off. I'm like, hey, you know, how are you? How's it going? And she's like, fine. Okay, so I'm going to tell her about, oh, these are my husband's travels and this is what the kids are doing in school and activities. And then my mom starts looking over my shoulder at the clock on the wall. It's my cue to leave. Five years of Saturday visits like this, okay? It is painful. I don't want to go. I feel like a bad daughter. I'm like, oh God, you know, but I'm really guilty and I am her only child now. So I'm going to still try to do this. I'm going to do this. You know, then the day comes that I get a phone call from my dad. My mom's not dead, but she is dying. And she has congestive heart failure and bad attitude, and she's just done doing everything with therapy. And so it's like, she's decided, take me off all of the ventilators. Go ahead and undo the feeding tube. So now I go to her deathbed. And I go into the room, I'm like, this is it, she is dying. You know, I've read about this. I mean, people sometimes have moments of clarity and they want to heal and do that sort of thing. I go in, sit down on the bed, I take my mom's hand, and I say, Mom, I love you. I wish we would have been closer. To which she says, it is what it is. <laughs> and that was my cue to leave. So she dies the next day. So then we're gonna go ahead and we plan her funeral. So you have to do things like pick out the color of the casket, and what color do you want her nails painted, and it's just really bizarre. And the other thing that was the bonus of my mom's dying is that now we get to bury Troy. Because for five years, his cremains, vocabulary word that was new to me at the time, um, the remains of people who are cremated, the cremains. His cremains had been in my parents' basement closet for five years. And so I was like, okay, we can get Troy buried. Troy loved our mom, so this is the chance. We're gonna do this. And the folks at the graveyard are like, that's all good. So after we planned everything, the graveyard lady, she comes out <laughs> to the car with my dad and I. And he opens up the front of the car and he gets out two outfits for me to choose from, and one is just heinous. The, the jacket, the pants, the colors don't match, the patterns don't match, I'm like, oh, for God's sake, no. And then the other outfit is something that was in a dry cleaning bag that it's obviously, my mom wore that as an outfit. So yes, we should bury her in that. And it's all we have some fun. <laughs> then, so he gives that to me, I hand it to Graveyard Lady. And then he's gonna get Troy out of the back seat of the car. So he opens the car. He leans in the car. And he hands me Troy. Troy is in a brown paper grocery bag. Like there's no urn. There's no, 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 no. It is his cremains in a brown paper grocery bag. Like from Russ's or Stuart's or something. And I am holding my brother in the back. And I'm mortified and sad, and I give him to the graveyard lady. When I lost Troy to mental illness, to suicide, when I lost my mom to who she was, as a person, to death, 
I lost opportunity. And the opportunity, while someone is here, there's still hope. I mean, there's still the chance to connect. There's still the chance that someone is gonna show some interest and it's gonna go back and forth, mutual support. So at this point, I'm waiting out my dad. I go do his pills. I hope someday he's gonna cast a shadow of interest. As I do this, I do it from the surface. I married the ringmaster. My children are acrobats, they are clowns, they fill my life with wonder and laughter. Every day when I step out on the high wire, which is my life of balancing act, underneath me is a net and it is woven with the love and acceptance and support of my family, my friends, my dear, dear Southwest English Department family. So I step out without fear because that is life 